So we've finished the Old Testament now. We've gone all the way from Genesis right up to Malachi. And we're going to be going on to the New Testament. But before we do that, I want to look at the Apocrypha because the Apocrypha refers to some books that are in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. They're not in the Protestant Bible, but they are in the Catholic and the Orthodox Bible. And so it's just important, I think, that we know about these things. And then I also want to next lecture, we're going to look at source texts again uh, in terms of, you know, where do we get, uh, the, you know, the New Testament from. And so we talk about the word canon. Now, the word canon there, we're not talking about the one that you shoot at people. Okay, uh, that's got two ends. This uh, comes from a Latin word uh, and indirectly from the Greek. And basically, it comes from a word that is, uh, you know, means a ruler or a reed. And so you're talking about a measurement. And there you can see where that word is actually used, the equivalent word in the Hebrew in uh, Ezekiel, talking about a measurement. So when we talk about the canon of Scripture, we're talking about a book where a rule has been applied to see if it measures up to certain criteria and whether we believe it's inspired scripture or not. So when we say a book is canonical, we mean that we believe it's inspired and it's part of the Bible. If we say it's not canonical, we don't believe it's inspired. And that's the category that the Apocrypha falls into. But it doesn't mean that all the Apocrypha is useless and has no value. There are some Apocryphal books that are useless. There's others that are useful, even though they're not inspired. And so the word Apocrypha originally meant hidden writings. And it comes from a root word, which is very similar to uh, where we get our English word cryptic from, hidden. Now, the term Apocrypha has got different meanings depending on whether you're Protestant or Catholic or Orthodox. So when you say Apocrypha and a Catholic says Apocrypha, you're talking about two different things. There's certain books they've got in their Bible. They've got additional books. We say they're Apocrypha. They call them deuterocanonical. So the Catholics and the Orthodox, uh, when they talk about deuterocanonical, they say they, it's a second canon part of Scripture. And so some of the books that the Catholics and Orthodox consider deuterocanonical, but Protestants say that they are apocryphal, they're not part of Scripture, are Tobit, Judith, 1 and 2 Maccabees, the Book of Wisdom, Serech, Baruch, the Letter of Jeremiah, in additions to Daniel and Esther. Now, another term you need to be familiar with is the intertestamental period. So I alluded to it earlier on. There you see the Old Testament and those events, and then you see the New Testament. Between that, there's actually a gap of about 400 years. So when we talk about the intertestamental period, we're talking about the gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we believe that there's no inspired scripture that was produced during that time. But why some of the books are useful because some of them are historical and they tell us a bit about what happened in between the two testaments so they are of value especially books like one maccabees uh, don't think that they're just valueless even if they're not canonical so um, effectively that 400 years the old testament ended with uh, the ministry of malachi which was about 420 bc and then obviously the new testament begins with events around the births of John the Baptist and Jesus. And so you've got this gap of 400 years intertestamental period. Sometimes people also talk about the second temple period, and it's approximately the same thing because when Herod built the second temple, uh, well, he refurbished it. It was first uh, rebuilt, as we know, um, you know by Zerubbabel. But um, when they talk about the second temple period, they have showed you as well, it's, it's sort of like a similar period. We talk about that period as being the 400 silent years because we say no inspired scripture was produced then. And when I say we, I'm referring to Protestants. Now, there are books that were produced then that all Christians, including Catholics and Orthodox, are apocryphal. So when you get books like The Assumption of Moses, The Ascension of Isaiah, 
apocalypse of Elijah, the testament of the 12 patriarchs, uh, all Christians are agreed that they are apocryphal. So that's why I say the term has got different meanings depending on which Christian group you belong to. So yeah, I've just drawn up a little table to give you a bit of an idea. Uh, Genesis to Malachi, you'll find that that's the Protestant Old Testament. And that is identical to the Jewish Tanakh. When I say it's identical, um, they've got a few amount of group uh, books, but that's just because they group some of the books together. So for example, uh, they don't have a one and two chronicles. They'll make it one book and first and second Kings. So they'll have either 22 or 24 books in their canon. But the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew scriptures, the Tanakh, and the Protestant Old Testament are exactly the same. Now the Catholics include all those books, but they add to it the books that I'm showing you over there as well. So they've got those additions and they say that that is the Deutero canon. It's part of a second canon in the Old Testament. So that's why if you get a Catholic Bible, you'll notice it's fairly longer because of those books there. And as I said, it's good to know this because not only are some of those books valuable to read, even if they're not scripture, if you ever speak into Catholics and they suddenly start talking to you about the book of Judith and you wonder what on earth they're talking about, at least now you've got a bit of background and you know that a book they believe should be in the Bible, but we say it's not canonical. Okay, so just to tell you briefly about some of them, the book of the Maccabees um, are effectively historical books. And the book of 1 Maccabees is actually a very interesting book because, uh, you know, a lot of the events that happened in those 400 years, um, you know, in the time that Alexander the Great uh, conquered the known world and uh, he had died. And then you found that, um, uh, you know, the area that the Jews lived in became part of a greater area that was ruled by the Seleucid dynasty, which was part of the Greek empire. And um, they persecuted the Jews quite badly, in particular, a guy called Antiochus uh, Epiphanes, and some of the Jews rebelled against him. And the book of 1 Maccabees and 2 Maccabees records those events, very interesting um, events. This group of Jews, um, Judah Maccabee, well, they called him Maccabee, but Maccabee literally means the hammer, Judah the hammer. And um, his brothers and his father, how they rebelled against, um, you know, the Greeks' persecution, where they wouldn't allow them to be circumcised. And Antiochus Epiphanes eventually desecrated the temple. He actually slaughtered a pig in the temple and set up an image of himself, when Jupiter, in the, in the temple. The book of Judith tells of a Jewish a woman who lives in Jerusalem when it's besieged by the Assyrians. And how God uses her to, you know, defeat the enemies of the Jews. Tobit is a story about two Jewish families. And Tobit is, is a blind man. And it's also got a, a woman called Sarah in there. And interestingly, it features an archangel called Raphael, who I believe is, you know, one of the seven archangels. He's not mentioned in canonical scripture. So in canonical scripture, it only mentions Gabriel and um, Michael. But we'll find mention of Raphael in this book as well as one of the angels. Then um, the wisdom lit literature. When we talk about wisdom literature, you're talking about books like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Psalms the poetical books, and um, Ecclesiasticus is similar to the book of Proverbs. And the book of wisdom, it's sometimes called the wisdom of Solomon, um, is similar to the book of Ecclesiastes. So just a sort of bird's eye view of what these books are about. The book of Baruch is in addition to the book of Jeremiah. You know your Bible history, you'll know that Jeremiah had a scribe whose name was Baruch. And so this book uh, purports to be written by the scribe of Jeremiah. Then not only are there these additional books, there's some additional uh, uh, additions to books uh, that are all canonical. So the additions to the book of Esther uh, that we consider apocryphal, and they have just li listed them all. So you'll find that in, um, you know, the, you know, the, the, the Bibles that, you know, contain, uh, this amended book of Esther, it contains everything we've got, but there's additions. And the same with the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is longer. And you'll get accounts in there like Balan the dragon. 
and the history of Susanna Bell and the Dragon is actually quite an interesting one. Whether these stories are actually really events that happened to Daniel that were just sort of added on by someone else, they are very interesting to read. In Bell and the Dragon, um, effectively Daniel does some sort of detective work. You've, you've got a case where um, the pagans are offering to this idol and the food that, that the priests put in there is always consumed when they come there in the morning. And so they take that as a sign that their God is real. And Daniel exposes their false God because he believes it's a fraud. And I think he spreads some soot or ashes on the floor there. And when they come in the morning, he shows the king that there's actually footprints there and the footprints lead to some secret passage. And what's been happening is the priests have been hoodwinking the people. They come at night and they steal the food and eat it. And then everybody thinks it's the God that's eating the food. So, so, so some of these books are quite, quite interesting to read. So why don't we consider the Apocrypha, and I'm talking about these books in particular, to be canonical? Well, firstly, the Apocrypha was never cited by Jesus or the apostles. So if we look at the writings in the New Testament, you don't find Jesus or the apostles quoting the Apocrypha, whereas there's lots of quotes, you know, from almost all the books in the Old Testament. You find that when Jesus talks about the Hebrew Scriptures, remember that we wouldn't have had the New Testament in Jesus' day. It hadn't been written yet. But when they talk about the Scriptures, they talk about the law and the prophets. And the law, remember, that's the Torah, the first five books, and the prophets. You've already gone through the prophets. And they use the prophets just as a general term to you know, include everything besides the five books of Moses. So if you look, for example, Luke 24, verse 27, it says that Jesus began with Moses, that's the Torah, and all the prophets. And he says, do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. So when they say the law and the prophets, they're talking about what we call the Old Testament. So they don't refer to the Apocrypha at all. And sometimes they'd add the Psalms, and so they'd have the poetry or the wisdom literature separate. So in 20, uh, Luke 24, 44, everything written about me, Jesus said, in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. So sometimes there was this three, three-way division, and that's something that has stuck, because remember when we told you about the, uh, the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible, they've got the law, the prophets, and the writings. The law is the Torah, the prophets is the Nevi'im. And the Ketavim is the writings, and that's where they get the acronym from, the Tanakh. So when you're speaking to a Jewish person, they talk about the Tanakh. That's the same as what we call our Old Testament. The law, the prophets, and the writings. But Jesus never alluded to or quoted the Apocrypha. Some people believe that Jesus possibly alludes to the extent of the Old Testament in the following passage when he's pronouncing judgment on some of his religious opponents, he said that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Why does Jesus say from Abel to Zechariah? Well, interestingly enough, if you look at the Jewish Bible, Abel's murder is recorded in the first book, the book of Genesis. Zechariah's death is recorded in two chronicles. Now, that's actually the last book in the Old Testament. Now, you may say, well, that's not the last book. Isn't it Malachi? Remember, I told you the Jewish Bible is identical to ours, but the order and the grouping is different. In the Jewish Bible, the last book is two chronicles. So their grouping is different. Identical books to what we got, but grouped differently. So it's interesting that Jesus actually says, you're going to be held accountable for all the righteous blood. And he says from Abel, who was in Genesis, the first book, to Zechariah, who was in the very last book. And some people believe he's there alluding to, you know, the Jewish scriptures. And there, I've just given some, I'm not going to read them all to you. find that uh, when the apostles write as well, this constant reference to the law and the prophets, the law and the prophets. Um, and when they quote scripture, there's never quotes from the Apocrypha. So we don't believe the Apocrypha is part of scripture. No apocryphal book is mentioned by name in the New Testament. Now, some people try to tell you that the Apocrypha is alluded to in places, but allusion is not the same as a direct quote. No direct quotes. But in contrast, the Old Testament 
as we understand it, has 283 direct quotations in the New Testament. So the Old Testament is quoted a lot, 283 times direct quotes, not alluded to, and yet the Apocrypha is never quoted. So that should tell us something about the view or that Jesus and the apostles had of the Apocrypha. They didn't consider it to be inspired scripture. Then the Apocrypha was never part of the Jewish canon. And still to this day, the Jews do not include the Apocrypha. Even though the books have got some very interesting things about their history, like the book of Maccabees, they don't include it in their Bible, the Tanakh. Now, some people will try to tell you that even by Jesus' time, uh, the Jews didn't have their Bible complete and they were still deciding what book should be in there and shouldn't be in that. I don't believe that's the case at all. And I got some detail in the note on it. I don't, uh, notes on it. I don't want to go into too much detail on it. But just to tell you how the Old Testament was put together, um, there was the Jewish tradition of what they called the Great Assembly, which was 120 scribes or rabbis that lived in the second temple period. Uh, remember, I told you what the second temple period is. And they say that it was initially gathered by Ezra and that it's actually alluded to in the book of Nehemiah as well. And part of what these guys did, besides acting as some sort of religious judges, they actually put the canon, the Old Testament canon together. They decided which books need to be, form part of scripture. And um, it's believed that included in this great assembly, which spanned a whole lot of years, were the prophets Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Some even identify Malachi with Ezra, by the way. That's just an interesting thing, because it seems like Malachi might be a title, because the word for angel in Hebrew is just Malachim, which just means messenger. And so we can't find any record of a man called Malachi in the Old Testament. So there is a tradition that Malachi, the messenger, is just really a another name for Ezra. Now, according to the Mishnah, which is, you know, Jewish writings, they say Moses, Moses received the Torah from Sinai and conveyed to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, the elders to the prophets, and the prophets to the men of the great assembly. So this great assembly were the guys, as I mentioned, who put together the books that form part of the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh what we call the Old Testament. But this great assembly disbanded about 332 years before Christ. So in other words, the, um, there's two points there. That tells, tells us that the Jewish Bible must have been complete by then. They decided on it. Not only that, most of the apocryphal books weren't even written then when they established the canon because a lot of them were written, remember, I told you in that period, 400 uh, BC to the birth of Jesus. So when they decided on what books were to be in their Bible, most of the apocryphal books weren't even written. Again, you'll find a lot of writings today, they'll, and even if you go into uh, Wikipedia and places like that, they'll say that the Jewish Bible was only settled, you know, after the time of Jesus at what they call the Council of, of Jamnia. That idea has been largely discredited. I don't want to go into all the details, but I'm just telling you that if you come across that, where they try to tell you that the Jewish Bible was only decided on years after Jesus, that's not true. It was effectively in place hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And that's why Jesus and them refer to the law and the prophets, something that was settled. And the Jews also refer to that period as being a period when no inspired scripture was written. So the Babylonian Talmud, which is, you know, part of uh, the Jewish rabbinic writing, says this. After the latter prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi had died, the Holy Spirit departed from Israel. Okay. So and it says, yet they were still able to avail themselves of the but call. And that means the daughter of a voice. And it refers to secondhand works that were not authoritative as that of the prophets. Maccabees, which is one of the apocryphal books, actually says of that period, remember it was written during, you know, the 400 
uh, years of the intertestamental period, says there was great distress in Israel, the worst since the time when prophets ceased to appear among them. So the book of Maccabees itself acknowledges that the, the, uh, it ceased to be prophets in Israel in that time. God no longer was speaking to Israel. So the Apocrypha were never part of the Jewish canon. We get a lot of useful information from a man called Josephus. His books are also very interesting. He wrote a book called The Antiquities of the Jews, where he covers a lot of what we find in the Bible. And he gives a lot of additional information about Moses and uh, Joseph and people like that. He actually lived 37 to 100 AD, so shortly after the time of Jesus. And he would have been a contemporary of guys like Paul and Peter. And he was actually a Pharisee. And he, he mentions both Jesus and John the Baptist and James, by the way. And he speaks of them very favorably, even though he was a Pharisee. But he, remember, this is not a Christian, but this is a, a Pharisee, mentions 22 Old Testament books that were accepted by the Pharisees as scripture. And that seems to match to the 24 book Jewish Tanakh and the current Protestant 39 book collection, because there were different groupings of these books. And this is what he says. He said, although such long ages have now passed, no one has ventured neither to add or to remove or to alter a syllable. So what is he telling us? He's telling us that the Jewish canon for long ages had been decided on. So these people who tell you it was only decided like 100 years after Jesus are, you know, not, you know, telling the, uh, the truth. Because Josephus, who lived at the time, says that the oldest, not, well, the Tanakh, had been settled for some time. And he refers to scripture divided into three parts, Moses, the five books, the prophets, 13 books, and four other books of hymns and wisdom. And again, I'm not going to go into all the details there, but we can pretty much find the way that he grouped them can be matched to the Jewish Bible today and to the Protestant Old Testament. No reference, well, there is a reference, but they didn't consider the apoc Apocrypha to be um, scripture and he says of those books it has become natural to all jews immediately and from their very birth to esteem these books to contain divine doctrines and to persist in them and if occasion be willingly to die for them it was the view of their scripture but listen to what he says about the apocryphal books he mentions and in fact you'll find that in his writings he uses a lot of material from books like the maccabees um, when he's talking about the history of that period. But he, when he talks about it, he says it is true, our history has been written since Artaxerxes. So he's talking about these 400 years, um, the intertestamental period, very particularly, but has not been esteemed of the like authority with the form of our forefathers. So he's saying, yes, there are books that were written in that period, but we don't regard them of the same value as scripture. And um, there's another first century Jew that we have a lot of their writings, a guy called Philo of, of Alexandria. And again, he would have lived around about the time of Jesus. And he, in his writings, hints at a threefold division of the Old Testament canon. He talks about the laws, the sacred oracles of God communicated by the holy prophets, and the Psalms. So very similar to what we see you know, in the New Testament, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Or as the Jews today will say, the law, the prophets, and the writings. And you will find writings from that time. They'll either talk about there being 24 books in the, the Jewish Bible, sometimes 22, but that's just because they grouped them differently, not because they had a different set of books. Today, the current Jewish uh, Tanakh consists of 24 books, but those 24 books, I reiterate, exactly the same as our 39 books, just because some books have been grouped together. Slightly different order, some books are combined together, but the content is the same. For example, they grouped entire minor prophets as one book. So um, that's why their book count is lower than ours, not because there's any difference. 
So the point, the main point I'm trying to make is that Josephus and the first century Jews never considered the Apocrypha to be part of the Jewish canon. They were aware of these books and they said they had some sort of value, but they weren't regarded as scripture. And so again, you'll find some people will try to appeal to the Septuagint. The Septuagint was a Greek translation of um, the Old Testament. And it was translated about two to 300 years before Jesus. And in fact, most of the quotes from the New Testament we're going to see in the next lecture actually come from the Septuagint. So it's a very important uh, translation because most of the people in the time of Jesus spoke Greek. And so this was a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. And with the, our earliest copies of the Septuagint, a lot of them have some of the apocryphal books in them. So you'll find that the Catholics and Orthodox will point to that and say, well, look, you know, these copies of the Septuagint we got have these books in them. But the point is, the earliest copy of the Septuagint we've got dates back to the fourth century after Christ. So we don't know whether they contain them earlier on. So it's not really a valid argument. And not only that, the books, book listings in these different copies we got are different. And so there I've just showed the Codex Vaticanus is a very old copy we have of the Septuagint and uh, the Codex Sinaiticus. Um, they don't all agree with each other. Some of them have got certain books in others. What they do agree is they all have what we call the Old Testament in there. But the oldest of these books uh, is hundreds of years after Jesus. Now, there was a Christian called Melita who lived about 170 AD, and he referred to uh, a set of books, and um, it's probably the oldest copy we have of what the Christians termed the Old Testament, and I've got it there in the footnote, it is in the details in the notes, and the list of books that he gives is virtually identical um, to what we have as the Old Testament, and that's already 170 AD. In fact, he includes all the books that we have except Esther, and he excludes all the books of the Apocrypha with the possible exception of the Book of Wisdom. The reason why I say the possible exception, we're not too sure if by the book, uh, when he talks about the Book of Wisdom, he possibly was referring to Proverbs as a pseudonym, the Book of Wisdom. It's not necessarily what the Catholics will call the Book of Wisdom. So he has a very early Christian who has a list of canonical Old Testament books, which doesn't include the Apocrypha. After uh, Melita, there's another early reference in what we call the Byrenius list uh, that we found. And this dates back to the first or second century as well. And it lists Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Joshua, Deuteronomy, etc., etc. A lot of books we're familiar with, but there's no Apocryphal books in it. Oregon is an early Christian from the second and third century, says that the canonical books as the Hebrews have handed them down are 22. Remember I told you sometimes I'll say 22, sometimes 24, because sometimes they grouped additional books together. Um, so there's Oregon telling us that they don't include the Apocrypha. He excludes the Apocrypha. Athanasius in AD 367, very famous Christian, the one who defended the Trinity um, at the Council of Nicaea also refers to uh, the books of the Bible. He mentions some of the books that are in the Apocrypha, but he cautions that they are not included in the canon. Even though people did read them at the time, they weren't considered canonical. Jerome is a very important Christian as well. He lived in the fifth century. Why is he important? Because he translated the Bible into Latin. Um, although there were earlier copies of the, uh, the Bible in Latin, they weren't very good translations. He produced a very good translation, which was used by the church for over a thousand years. The Catholics used um, Jerome's translation. It's called the Vulgate. And so um, when he talks about the Jewish canon at that time, he mentions that they're either 22 or 24 books.
Now, there were some early leaders of the church who thought that some of the books of the Apocrypha were scripture, but most did not. So Jerome, very important, as I say, the guy who actually translated the Bible used by the Catholics, uh, said that they weren't canonical. He said that they were worthwhile reading, but that they shouldn't be used to establish doctrine. Very important. And that's the same view we have as well. We don't believe that they are useless, but we don't believe that we establish doctrine from them. And in fact, he didn't even translate some of them. And the reason he didn't was he moved to Bethlehem. And when he moved to Bethlehem while he was doing his translation, he found that the Jews didn't use them in their Bible. So even though he initially translated some of the books that are in the Apocrypha, when he found out, for example, that Maccabees wasn't regarded by scriptures, the Jews, he didn't bother to translate them. So the translation of the Maccabees that you get in, um, in the Vulgate weren't actually done by Jerome. They were older translations that were put in because he didn't bother to even translate them once he found out they weren't regarded a scripture by the Jews. So, yeah, I'll just give you some excerpts from, uh, you know, the notes that Jerome wrote in the Vulgate when he writes an introduction to certain books. So um, in his preface to Samuel and Kings, he writes the following. He says, uh, in our list must be placed among the apocryphal writings, wisdom, and he's talking about the book of wisdom that the Catholics use which generally bears the name of Solomon and the book of Jesus, the son of Sirach and Judith and Tobias and the shepherd are not in the canon. He's making it clear. They're not canonical. When he talks about the book of Baruch, remember, which is says added to Jeremiah, he says it is neither read nor held among the Hebrews. He makes it very clear. When he talks about Ecclesiasticus and wisdom, he says that they are falsely ascribed works. What does he mean by that? He says they weren't actually written by Solomon, even though they were ascribed to him. And I'm not going to read you the whole quote there. So the point I'm making is that the early Christians as well, although there were some who thought that these books should be included in scripture, generally they did not. So I found a Catholic website where they make the following claim. They say that the Council of Hippo and Carthage were first attempts to decide in the canon. That's not true. The Catholic canon as we have it today was only decided very late. It was actually decided at the Reformation and um, at the Council of Trent. And it was in reaction to Martin Luther. And we'll see why. So even among the Catholics, then, they were disagreed as to whether the Apocrypha should be in the Bible or not. The Council of Laodicea, for example, around 363 to 364 AD, excluded the Apocrypha besides two books. And the only very influential Christian um, you know, at that time, who regarded these books as being, you know, canonical was Augustine. So Augustine was a very important church father, but so was Jerome. So you had these two different camps. Guys like Augustine said, no, they should be in the Bible. Guys like Jerome said they shouldn't be in the Bible. They, yes, they're good books, but they're not inspired. And if you ever come across Catholics who tell you that, that these very early councils had decided they should be in the Bible. That's not true. In fact, you can actually find very prominent Catholics who said that they weren't supposed to be in Scripture. And one of the examples that I've given there is Cardinal Cajetan. He's actually the man who opposed Martin Luther. And in 1518, he published a commentary on all the authentic historical books of the Old Testament, and he excluded the Apocrypha. That was a Catholic scholar. And there's another cardinal who also made a distinction between, the, a distinction between the Apocrypha and the Old Testament. And even the Catholic Encyclopedia admits that that was the case. So let me just read this to you. This is from the Catholic Encyclopedia. They say, in the Latin church, all through the Middle Ages, we find evidence of hesitation 
about the character of the Deuterocanonicals. Those are the apocryphal books. There is a current friendly to them, another one distinctly unfavorable to the authorities. So they're saying that there were two camps, which is what we find. And they mention that even Thomas Aquinas, who's a highly revered medieval Catholic scholar, didn't believe, you know, or was uncertain as to whether these books should be in the Bible. One of the most important scholars. So it wasn't the official view of the Catholic Church until the 16th century and was at the Council of Trent. And you know why? Because one of the reasons was when Martin Luther uh, broke away from the Catholic Church, remember the Protestant Reformation, and they were trying to argue against him, and he was saying doctrines like the doctrines of purgatory were unscriptural. You know, purgatory says that when you die, you don't go to heaven or hell, you go to a waiting place, and people can pray you out of that waiting place, or if they pay money to the church, you can be released, you know, this whole lot of nonsense. And when he challenged them on this, and they couldn't find scripture to back up these things, they eventually found some scripture in Maccabees that they appealed to. And Luther's argument, well, that's not even part of scripture. And so they then at their council decided, well, let's put it in scripture. I'll say they're going to argue against Martin Luther. And so it was really the fact that those books contained material which lends support to certain Catholic doctrines which were disputed by the Protestants. So up until the 16th century, the Catholic Church themselves, including leading uh, Catholics like Jerome and um, uh, Thomas Aquinas, would have told you that the apocryphal books aren't part of Scripture. And so I found a Catholic website which admits that in response to the Protestants, the Council of Trent definitively upheld the larger Old Testament canon. They're saying that because of Martin Luther and the Protestants, and to try to defend their doctrines against him, which he said were unscriptural, they then decided, well, they had to make the Old Testament a bit bigger to include books which seemed to support their doctrines. So that's the gist of that. Okay, so we need to move, uh, move on. But, so I've told you, the Apocrypha was not used by Jesus and the Apostles. It wasn't regarded by the Jews ever as being scripture. Uh, we see that the early church was divided on it. There was a camp, a minority camp, who said they should be in scripture, but the majority of Christians said no. And even the Catholics themselves only decided in the 16th century to include them in scripture. But thirdly, the reason we, we believe they shouldn't be in the Bible, hence why you're not going to be studying them, you know, uh, in your Bible survey, but as I say, I think it's important for us to at least know about them, is that there's certain doctrinal issues. So, as I've already pointed out to you, the doctrine of purgatory, according to this doctrine, they'll say that when you die, some people go to hell, but very few people go straight to heaven, because sometimes you haven't done enough good works, and so you go to a place called purgatory, and you have to kind of pay a bit for your sin, you know, suffer a little bit. When you've suffered a little bit, then you can go to heaven. There's nothing in the Bible about that. I mean, Jesus paid for our sins on the cross, and you die, you either go to heaven or hell. And it's not through our works. But it was used in the time of Luther where they were actually um, raising money to build some of their churches. Um, and this is what he objected to. A man called Johann Tetzel was going around selling indulgences where basically – they would say to you, you know, your grandfather is in purgatory and he's suffering, but if you pay money to the church, we'll, you know, ask God to let him out earlier. And, you know, what kind of a cruel person are you that you're going to let your grandfather suffer in purgatory, you know, when you could just give us some money? And Luther was incensed at this because it goes against the teaching of Scripture. We, you, you know, our sins aren't paid for by money or, you know, by good works. They're paid for by Jesus on the cross. And Hebrews 9 verse 27 says it's appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. You don't go sit in purgatory. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8, Paul says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. We go straight into the Lord's presence when we die, if we've served him. If not, you go, you know, to, you go to hell. <laughs> and so, 
as I pointed out, when they were trying to argue with Luther, they eventually found this verse in two Maccabees, which appeared to defend their doctrine. And so they have this point where Judah Maccabee makes intercession for the dead. And I've just highlighted the part there. It talks about Judah Maccabee made atonement for the dead that they might be delivered from their sin. So they said, well, yeah, that proves there must be a place like purgatory. And that was the one verse that they could find from an apocryphal book. Martin Luther, of course, said, well, that's not even scripture. The apocrypha teaches the doctrine of creation ex materia. What I mean by that, that means that the creation was made out of matter that already existed. And there's the quote from the Book of Wisdom, which said that the world was brought into being out of formless matter. The Bible teaches the doctrine that we call creation ex nihilo, if you've ever heard it. The uh, biblical teaching is that the creation was made from nothing. Hebrews 11.3 says, what he's seen was not made out of things that are visible. So we believe, according to the scripture, God made the world from nothing. Yeah, we have the apocrypha saying he had material to work with, which is the opposite of what the Bible says. Sirach, it's also sometimes called Ecclesiasticus, not the book of Ecclesiastes, even though it sounds similar, talks about women as being responsible for the fall and for sin. And so here's a quote from the book. It says, sin began with the first woman, and because of her, we all must die. That's not scriptural. The Bible says the opposite. 1 Corinthians 15.22 says, as in Adam all die. Romans 5 verse 19 says, by one man's disobedience. So the Bible makes it very clear that God held man accountable. That woman was deceived, but that man sinned knowingly. And so he was held accountable. Uh, there's nothing in the Bible that says that Eve was held responsible. Adam was held responsible. Apocrypha also contains certain material which is unbecoming of God's authorship. So, for example, there's this verse which you know, talks about the sin of a woman being worse than that of a man. You know, why would God differentiate between the sins of a woman and a man? Yeah, from the book of Sirach, the sins of men are small compared to those of women. And I pray that women who sin will be severely punished. That's not scriptural at all. If you sin, whether you're a man or a woman, it's the same to God. He doesn't view it differently now because you're a male. It's somehow it's less serious. You find that in the book of Tobit, it talks about the angel Raphael advising uh, that a heart and a liver of a fish can be burned in order to chase away a demon or evil spirit. That's not something, you know, that you know, ties up with any scriptural doctrine. Um, you know, the strange sort of exorcism, you don't find Jesus doing that. When Jesus came across demons, he rebuked them and they left. And the apostles, you know, commanded them in the name of Jesus. They didn't have to go, you know, burn fish or cook fish or go through any sort of ritual, you know, to get demons to leave. So it's very doubtful that the angel Raphael would have said that. Furthermore, Raphael in this book is supposed to have said you can use the gallbladder to treat someone basically who's blind. Just rub it on his eyes and blow in the film and he'll be able to see again. Now, that's just not true. Okay, if you take the gallbladder of a, of a fish and put it on someone's eyes who's blind, they're not going to be able to see. So it's highly unlikely that an angel of God would be telling someone that. And then we also find that the Apocrypha has got some irreconcilable, irreconcilable historical errors. Now, I know there's some people who would try, you know, find errors in the Bible, but we are able to refute those. Where people find seemingly discrepancies or seemingly uh, problems historically, we are able to defend those quite adequately. Um, there are problems in the Apocrypha that simply can't be defended. So, for example, in the book of Judith, it refers to a village that she comes from called Bethulia. We've got absolutely no archaeological evidence or any other reference to that village. It appears that the story is just one that has been made up. And this isn't actually a historical village. 
In fact, the opening verse contains blatant historical er errors. This is what the opening of the book of Judith says. It was the 12th year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar who ruled over the Assyrians in the great city of Nineveh. That's a blatant error. Nebuchadnezzar never ruled over the Assyrians. He ruled over the Babylonians. And he didn't rule from Nineveh. He ruled from Babylon. Now, anyone who knows a bit about history will know that that's true. So whoever wrote this book, even though they were either deliberately, you know, just telling a story they were making up, or else they were ignorant of the fact that Nebuchadnezzar was king of the Babylonians. There's no way you can reconcile things like that. And then you also find that the death of Antiochus Epiphanes, there's discrepancies between it if you read the book of 1 Maccabees and 2 Maccabees, and they're discrepancies that you cannot um, you know, reconcile. So the book of 1 Maccabees say that uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, remember this horrible ruler who persecuted the Jews, fell sick and died after he had been defeated or on receiving news that some of his troops had been defeated. But uh, in the book of 2 Maccabees, they talk about him being in another place and dying of a sickness. And, uh, you know, then in 2 Maccabees 1 verse 10 to 17, it talks about, you know, him being killed some, by some priests because he wanted a looted temple. So these books, as I say, although they are good, although they've got merit in reading them, they don't even agree with themselves as to a historical, you know, event as to how Antiochus Epiphany actually died. Now, just to tell you a little bit about some of the uh, Catholic Bibles you get today, the oldest English Catholic Bible is the Dowry Reims that was produced, you know, during the 16th century. And that was actually not a translation from Hebrew and Greek. They translated it from the Vulgate. So it's translated from the Latin. And they put the books of the Apocrypha mingled with the other books, not separate. But... If you look at Bibles today, and I'm not going to go through all of them, those Bibles that I'm listing there are Catholic Bibles. And so you'll find that in their Old Testament, they'll have 73 books, whereas our Old Testament has got 66. So they've got additional books. And those, you'll even find that certain um, Bibles, like the Good News, will have a Catholic edition, which got the additional um, additional books in. So you'll get the normal good news translation that we would use, and then they've got a special Catholic version with the extra books in them. And the same with the NLT, the New Living Translation, and the ESV. Both of them have got Catholic editions. So, moving on. There's a slightly different set of books in the Orthodox Bible. If you don't know who the Orthodox are, the Orthodox are uh, include the Greek Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox. So the Catholic uh, Church was predominant and strong in the, in the West, in Western Europe. Uh, in East Europe, in Russia, and in Greece, um, they spoke a different language, which was Greek. In the Western Church, they spoke Latin, and that's why they had the Vulgate as their Bible. In the Eastern Church, they still used the Greek Bible. And although they got similarities to the Catholic canon, it's not the same. They add even more books to it. And so the easiest way of showing you that is just to give a table once again. So remember, everybody accepts the 39 books. The Jews agree on the 39 books. So do the Protestants. So do the Catholics. So do the Orthodox. The Catholics add their extra books. But here are extra books um, besides the ones that the Catholics accept. Those ones over there at the top in dark blue are the ones that Catholics accept and the Orthodox, but there's additional ones that the Orthodox add as well. They've got even more books. And in fact, the Ethiopian church has got even more books. They've got a very, very, you know, a much larger canon. Fortunately, everybody agrees on the New Testament. Okay, so the New Testament, everybody's got the same set of books. And everybody includes the Old Testament, but you do find that the Catholic and the Orthodox will add certain books which we call Apocrypha, as I've said again, I'll say it, uh, say it now, useful, interesting, but there's certain problems with them. We don't consider them inspired. Jesus didn't use them. Apostles didn't use them. So, yes, read them, and you can get some value out of them, but don't establish doctrine from them for all the reasons I've given. Okay, there's some overviews of those books. I'm not going to go through them for the sake of time because we've only got eight minutes left. But the, in your notes, I'll just tell you a bit about what the different books 
are about. Um, for example, the martyrdom of Isaiah describes the way in which Isaiah, you know, died at the hands of Manasseh. Now, it's interesting that we do believe that Isaiah was martyred, and the book of Hebrews seems to allude to that when it talks about, um, you know, uh, the years of the faith, and it talks about some were sawn in two. That's a reference to Isaiah, and so there is this historical tradition that Isaiah was sawn in two by Manasseh. So there is a basis in history for some of these. Two that I just want to point out to you are the book of Jubilees and the book of Enoch's. Enoch. These are very important books. And even though they're not in our Bible, they are in the Ethiopian Bible, they're very interesting. In fact, the book of Jubilees is a commentary on the book of Genesis and Exodus. And there's some very inf uh, uh, interesting information. And it was actually used by a lot of the early Christians. And it was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. The book of Enoch. As well, the book of Enoch has got some very interesting stuff about the origins of the giants and the demons. But it's also got interesting part about the Messiah. And this was written years before Jesus came. And some of the prophecies there and the things that are said are so astounding that if you didn't know, people would try to argue it was written by Christians afterwards. But we know because they found it now among the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was actually, you know, um, you know, references to what he calls the son of man and his amazing prophecies about about jesus and the book of enoch i believe that the oldest part was written by enoch so people would try to tell you that it was written by someone else um, how do i know that because the book of enoch is actually quoted in the new testament jude quotes it so jude says enoch the seventh from adam prophesied you know see the lord is coming with ten thousands of his angels that's actually a quote from the book of enoch so the fact that Jude quotes from it shows that he believed the book had value, but also he says Enoch said. So he says that Enoch wrote that, and that is actually from the book of Watches, which is, the, I believe, the oldest part of the book. So I think that what happened is these five parts of the book of Enoch, the other ones were added later, but that oldest one was the original book of Enoch, and that's the one that Jude quotes. And many of the early church writers quoted from it. And in fact, you can find that both Jude and Peter were familiar with the book of Enoch. Because the book of Enoch talks about the angels before the flood who sinned, that we read about in Genesis 6, and God putting them um, in, in the abyss and chaining them. Now, that's actually referred to by Peter and Jude. And they're not quoting Genesis because there's nothing in Genesis about those angels being chained. But read the book of Second Peter, and it talks about how God before the flood, you know, certain angels were chained to wait to judgment. Where did he get that information from? They were quoting from the book of Enoch. So as I say, books like this, there is certainly merit in the book of Enoch, even though the whole book we don't consider canonical because there were additions to it. So again, Oregon, the early church writer, quotes the book of Enoch, but distinguishes it from Holy Scripture. So even a book like that, which is quoted by Jude, we don't consider that the entire book is canonical. So, just to wrap it up, does the Apocrypha have value? Should we bother to read them? Well, you know, if you don't want to read them, that's fine. They're not scripture, but I don't have a problem. In fact, I find very, some of these books very interesting. Don't try my doctrine from them, but I'm going to tell you right now that there is some value in, in certain books of the Apocrypha. And so um, Protestants regard them as useful, but not part of scripture. And they have just got quotes from some Protestant uh, confessions which say exactly that, where they say that the Apocrypha is useful, you can use it, but not to be regarded as the same authority as other holy books. And um, that's pretty much was the opinion of Jerome, and not only that, it was the part, uh, opinion of Martin Luther as well. So in his preface to the Apocrypha, this is what Jerome wrote. Bear in mind that Jer Jerome was the guy who produced the Catholic Bible. He said, these are books that, though not esteemed like the Holy Scriptures, are still both useful and good to read. So he's saying, read them. They're good. They're not Scripture, though. And Martin Luther said pretty much the same thing. He went back to what Jerome said, and he was in agreement. They're not part of Scripture, and that's why he excluded them from his Bible. So Don Stewart, I like what he says. He says, the fact that the Apocrypha is not considered to be Holy Scripture does not mean that it is entirely worthless. 
the books do have some value. And then he says something similar to what I've been saying along that the book of First Maccabees, for example, is very interesting from a historical point of view. I found it a very interesting book to read. So I've got three minutes to tell you about the New Testament Apocrypha. This is a lot easier because, as I say, fortunately, Protestants, Catholics, Orthodox, and the Coptic all agree on the 27 books of the Bible. So we do have a, uh, books, apocryphal books in the New Testament, but all Christians are in agreement that they don't belong in the Bible. So it's a lot easier with the New Testament. With the Old Testament, they all agree on the 39 books. But the Catholics take some extra books and the Orthodox take some extra books more than the Catholics. And then the Ethiopians take even more books and say so these should also be part of the Old Testament. When it comes to the New Testament, um, there's agreement. When they talk about pseudepigrapha, that's just a reference to falsely attributed books. That means where the author claims to be someone that they're not in order to try to give their, word, their work more authority. So it's like me writing a book and I sign it Isaiah, the prophet, you know, whatever, <laughs> to try to pretend Isaiah wrote it so that people will take it more seriously. Obviously, if a, book, if a person's giving a false authorship, it's questionable as to how valuable their writing is. And so here are some of the books that, for example, the early church um, you know, uh, writers would allude to, but we don't include in the scripture, the principle of Barnabas, the Didache. And they're interesting. I find it sometimes good to refer to them as well, because you can see how certain doctrines progressed in the church and the church's understanding on certain issues, but not part of scripture. And then finally, there's certain uh, books that are actually downright heretical. So when you get the books that were produced by a group called the Gnostics, it was multiple groups. These are not only not part of scripture, they are heresy. So when people talk to you about the gospel of Thomas and, uh, you know, th th things like that, and the gospel of Philip and gospels of Mary, and they've got all these gospels. Firstly, I want to tell you that those weren't written in the first century. They weren't written by Thomas and Philip and Mary. And they weren't even written in Greek. They were, most of them were written in Coptic, which is uh, the language that they used in, in Egypt. And they were found, you know, in fairly recent times at a place called Nagamadi in Egypt in 1945. And there was a big to do made about them saying, oh, these are additional gospels. They weren't written by the eyewitnesses. And most of the stuff that's in them are legendary stories. And so um, Dan Brown, for example, made a big deal about this when he wrote his book, The Da Vinci Code. He tried to make it that these books were, you know, suppressed by the church or whatever. Um, they were never suppressed by the church. The church didn't, didn't ever regard them as part of scripture. And so the church was aware of them. So you find that the early church writers referred to these, uh, you know, books that are out there, but they make it clear that they weren't ever regarded as scripture. They weren't written by, you know, the eyewitnesses and most of them are heretical. So I've just included a whole lot of these over here. And so there's just a quote from Irenaeus. Remember, he's the second generation disciple of John in the second century. And he refers to a Gnostic sect who claimed to have more than four gospels. And um, so he says over here, but those that are from Valentinus, he was a Gnostic. On the other hand, although reckless, while they put forth their own compositions, boast that they possess more gospels than they really are. And he goes on to show that the church has always been agreed that there's four gospels. Okay, I'm not going to go through these quotes here. We've run out of time, but I have included some quotes there which can actually show you how ridiculous some of those books are. You know, you get guys talking about them and, you know, uh, claiming that they're sort of hidden teachings of Jesus, but you have, if you actually read them, you can see why they were considered worthless by the church. They've got utter rubbish in them. Or maybe read one of them. The Gospel of Thomas, for example, uh, when you get to Dan Brown, the Da Vinci Code, he, you know, claims that things like the gospel of Thomas were sort of, you know, suppressed teachings of Jesus. Well, as I said, the gospel of Thomas wasn't written by Thomas. It was written either in the second or third century. The writer doesn't even claim to be Thomas. And if you read it, it's actually incoherent. It's not even useful. It's utter nonsense. Listen to some of the things here. I just took some verses out here. I downloaded it. Jesus said, lucky is the lion that the human will eat. 
so that the lion becomes human and foul is the human that the lion will eat and the lion will still become human. What does that mean? A lot of ru rubbish. Jesus said, whoever has come to understand the world has found only a corpse and whoever has found a corpse is superior to the world. Does it make sense to you? <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> Read you one more. Jesus said, the dead are not alive and the living will not die. Do you in the days when you ate what is dead, you made it come alive? When you are in the light, what will you do? On the day when you were one, you became two. But when you became two, what will you do? <laughs> Very inspirational. Anyway, I put some of these gems. I call them gems from the Gospel of Thomas. So when you get people telling you that this was a suppressed gospel, well, you can see why. <laughs> <laughs> because it was a bunch of rubbish. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to leave it over there, folks.